A big hello and a very warm welcome to Brand Equity with me, Sonali Krishna. Well, we're way past Women's Day and all the chatter around it has dimmed. And the so-called gestures, which I call tokenism, has been put to bay until the 8th of March, 2025. On the Brand Equity Show, I took a strategic call not to have a conversation about women during the International Women's Day week. Now that life has gone back to normal and conversations about women forgotten, I thought it was an opportune time to talk about the same subject, attempting to signal that this conversation is not a one day or a one weekend or a one week affair. Unless there is continuous dialogue, we are not going to move the needle significantly. And with that, let's get on with the program. As India's population booms, where are its working women? Did you know that as per the International Monetary Fund, as much as half of the world's work is unpaid? And not surprisingly, most of it is done by women. This disparity not only deprives women of economic opportunities, but also incurs costs to society in the form of diminished productivity and foregone economic growth. Furthermore, as per World Bank statistics, India's female labor force participation rate stood at 19.2% in 2021, accounting for 17% of the country's gross domestic product. Conversely, figures from the Indian government indicate women's workforce participation hovering around 25%. Well, this data highlights the persistently low representation of women in the formal workforce in India. It is, however, worthwhile to note that indicating an upward trend, the Periodic Labour Force Survey Report 2022-23, released by the Ministry of Statistics and Programme Implementation in October 23, showcases an increase of 4.2 percentage points, pushing the female labour force participation rate in India to 37% in 2023. Rising education levels, a decrease in the fertility rate and a downward spiral of social prejudices are credited to having been fueling women's greater participation in formal labour. However, the rise in the female labour force participation from 2017-18 to about 2022-23 is attributed to a substantial increase in rural women's participation, almost close to 41%, suffering from chronic lower wages and poor working conditions compared to urban women, which stand at about 5.3%. This increase is also concentrated in the vulnerable self-employed category, while the formal salaried employment sector has recorded a decline of 5 percentage points. Experts fear that this rise may subside even further with women returning to their homes once the economic compulsions are put at bay, as seen in previous periods. I am now joined by four women today who have not just broken the glass ceiling, but shattered it. But let me remind you that these women are aberrations and definitely not the norm. So without further ado, let me introduce to you my guests for today. First up, Arundhati Bhattacharya, Managing Director and CEO of Salesforce, Naya Sagi, Group Co-Founder of the Good Lab Group, Sairi Chahal, Founder and CEO of She Rose and Mahila Mani, and last but not the least, Babita Barua, CEO of VML, one of India's largest advertising agencies. Thank you so much, women. Truly a pleasure having you on brand equity and of course supporting this entire initiative of going past women's day to look at conversations that revolve around the women workforce one week or about 10 days post uh, all the all the flutter and all the hullabaloo around women's day so let me come back to the key question of this show as india booms and its population grows where are its working women I've made quite a substantial introduction, so I'd like to open the floor with you, Arundhati, who's been there, done that, and continues to be doing it, in terms of your sheer observations of the years gone by and what you hope 2024 will bring to the table. Well, thank you very much, first of all, for having me on the show. And it's true, I personally don't believe in just having a single women's day. It achieves uh, really nothing. 
unless and until we make sure that this is uh, an agenda that's uh, discussed in every boardroom, that this is the focus of management for every organization, and that you know all of the people who can make a difference, including the government, that this is something that is reviewed on a regular basis. Having said that, I must say that awareness on inclusion, awareness on diversity has definitely been on the rise. Uh, we have seen women making a lot of effort, even within their organizations, to ensure that they are referring more women. Uh, organizations such as ours, uh, that is Salesforce, uh, we do what is called a yearly audit to ensure that there is no inequality of pay for people doing the same jobs at the same rank between yeah. the two uh, genders. So there's a gender equality audit that takes place every single year. Until date, Salesforce has spent something like $22 million in order to close the gender pay disparity. So, you know, we need programs such as those on the ground, which actually, you know, look at these issues and try and close them out in order to ensure that women don't fall off the workforce and feel enthused enough to join and remain in order to build a career. Sure. Uh, let me take it to you, uh, Naya. You know, we've seen this conversation for, for now quite so many years. And the fact that across levels, uh, we see women falling off the workforce for different compulsions. Uh, you know, one would assume, uh, and, and this is a larger, very large assumption, that now that we are in 2024, and we've had sufficient time as a country to kind of mature and evolve, that some of our social prejudices would have, put to, would have been put to rest. Some of our uh, so-called lack of progressive mindsets uh, would have been overcome. And the fact that, you know, in 2024, some of those issues which were predominantly uh, the key reasons for women falling off the workforce across levels, maybe even 10 or 20 years ago, uh, should have seen enough progress to see that, you know, women in uh, at least, you know, in, in middle management before they make that big pivot to senior management uh, remain to see that that big transition before, of course, you know, life takes over. Uh, you know, Sonali, I think we're in a very interesting paradigm uh, when we speak of India and the workforce participation of women in India in particular, right? Because you have one of the largest entrants of STEM uh, and graduates of STEM in, wow. in the world being Indian women, right? So 45% of STEM graduates in India are actually women. And mm -hmm. then on the top, you know, with the legislation we've seen and the amendments we've seen to the, uh, you know, the uh, Companies Act, you're actually seeing now 20% of both seats being occupied by women, right? So you're kind of seeing this very interesting sort of like almost like a, a an hourglass where you're seeing some sort of change happening at the very, very top in boards and some changes happening at the very beginning in the entry level. I think it's the missing middle, Mm. as I like to call it, right? That's where women are falling off. And honestly, it's more for a practical reason. You know, there is something real about the maternity tax, right? So when women are becoming pregnant and when they are becoming mothers, given that 75% of India now lives in nuclear families, there is no support, there is no infrastructure around this entire very practical journey of motherhood and childbearing, right? And child rearing in particular. I think this is where, you know, we're hearing more stories of companies and organizations and, you know, teams coming together and saying, how do we have better like back to work or, you know, really incentivize and really create economic incentives for women to regain and retain their jobs and get motivated to come back. But, yeah. you know, that's really where I feel the largest drop off is happening today. And that's what the numbers also say. I think the second piece to it is, you know, the money that's actually still being held is, you know, we've still been playing largely in the man's world, right? So if you look at, for instance, the fact that 20% of startups today are founded by women, mm -hmm. uh, which is amazing from where we were earlier, right? And that's 80,000 startups we're talking about. It's not a minuscule number. But if you look at the number, amount of funding that's going to women-led startups, it's still much smaller, right? It's still like sub 10%. And the reason for that is that the resources are still controlled by folks who don't look like women, who are not women for the most part. And therefore, you know, there are, of course, biases and implicit, explicit biases that come to play. So I think there's there's two pieces to address here. One is, you know, the, the actual 
uh, structural support that we as society, as you know, regulatory bodies, as workplaces are really putting in place to support women very, very actively. And number two, the money movement and how to really manage that flow so it goes to people who are women and who are incentivized to continue being part of the economic journey of their ventures and you know build their own financial sort of uh, journeys out. Fair enough. Uh, let me take it to Sairi, who would, I think, have a, a bird's eye view on, on the struggles of women. And, and really, my question is, uh, you know, we know of all the compulsions women have, women have to face. But will 2024 be that year where women will achieve uh, equitable numbers in business leadership? Will companies soon chart more fair representation regarding, you know, uh, the race, gender identity, all of that, is that all coming together or am I going to be having the same discussion, uh, you know, as we progress and transition out of 2024 and come 2025? Um, thank you, Sonali. I think, uh, so when I look at uh, last 15 years of work around women and internet and women in workforce, I think a couple of things stand out. One, we cannot let go of the fact that uh, India is not seeing job growth at a macro level. So we know as a country, uh, if the macro funnel of jobs is not growing, we are not going to see uh, a fundamental increase in the number of women in the workforce because that opportunity doesn't exist or it's at least uh, super scarce. So, uh, however, there is definitely a rise in what I call shadow employment via entrepreneurship and uh, self-employment. So, uh, in the last five to seven years, we've seen almost 300 million women come online. And, and we also know digital payments as it has sort of penetrated the country. Now, this is this is a whole generation of women who probably will not make it to corporate jobs, but will continue to create some economic value, either through entrepreneurship or self-employment or services. And I think we definitely need to be cognitive of, of this whole change. To answer your question, I don't think 2024 will flip the switch, but oh. we're seeing some very interesting trends, like going back to what Naya said on the funnels, for the first time, there are more number of women in IAMs at an MBA level, which means there's a really strong generation of business leaders who are going to come into the workforce. So mm. we are a lot more ready with the funnels and with the pipelines than ever before. We definitely need to make sure that companies stay proactive. So if, you, if you're tracking the space, you'll, you will also see that the level of proactiveness has definitely gone up. So if you if you take, let's say, 2023, 20, uh, 2013, 2014 numbers, we're going to definitely see that the level of conversation has changed. The level of retention in companies has changed. Sure. There are more women leaders, uh, and we are seeing more women entrepreneurs, but we're not there yet. I think we still need another 20, 30 years of work, solid work, before we achieve 40, 50% parity at a at a fundamental level. But at the same time, we also need to be cognitive of the fact we are a very large country and maybe there are alternate solutions. We always do our leapfrog in everything. There's going to be a leapfrog here as well where women will become drivers of employment. And I think we should not let go of that opportunity at all. I truly hope that's true. Uh, let me come to you, Babita. And for you, Babita, I have a very personal question. You know. You've been an advertising professional, a veteran of sorts for years, right? Uh, but if you look at the number of women who've managed to, from senior positions, transition themselves to a position of power and the top job as CEO, with women, I, I mean, maybe two or three, right? And this coming from an industry which is supposed to be a lot more progressive than, let's say, you know, some of the others we know. Uh, you yourself have made the transition to get the top job and be the top dog after decades of service when you could have been in contention, let's say, a decade ago. Uh, where are you seeing the lacunas in the system? Thank you, Sorali. First of all, a pleasure to be here. And thank you for the invite. Uh, you're right. I mean, uh, you know, the, the time and the rigor and the hard work pays off. So that's the first thing. But is it soon enough and are there enough women, uh, right? And this begs a question which has multiple answers in my view. Um, and let me start with one which is more societal. Uh, it's also from personal experience and from conversations with friends and colleagues. 
and some which are pressures from the organization and of course the world. So the first one is, especially in our industry, Sonali, you know that, right? These are parallel industries. The pressure on time and the pressure on the work is so much that it has a conflict all the time with societal pressures, which is expectations that especially countries in Asia have of women, right? Role of a mother, role of a daughter, role of a daughter-in-law. I can tell you during COVID, when you know we were all working online, there were teams, there were women who were actually saying, we wish we could go back to work because when we are at work, nobody really questions us back home. as to what are we doing for those nine hours or 12 hours or whatever? But when you're at home, immediately the pressure is on, even when I'm working from home, you know what, it's lunchtime, take a break. Why don't we sit together, serve the food, cook the food, go back. Or if it's very late, who are you really talking to? Do you need to now? Et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, right? And that's a big burden. A lot of women feel that if there is financial support at home, do I really need to take that burden? And which is why I think the panel has spoken about that middle where you suddenly see a big drop. Because that's when also financially you become a little more independent. You become confident of perhaps doing something on your own or not doing anything, but again, doing a very good job of, you know, um, being a homemaker, etc. Oh, so that's yeah. one part of it, right? Which is an industry issue of just the kind of work that we do and the number of hours we have to keep. The other Sodali is a perception, right? And uh, you're right, handling what are the, the ratios are changing, first of all. You know, they're good ratios, but how many women are really in jobs which manage p &Ls? That's the question. How many women are there in jobs that really require managing a business versus parallel work streams where they play an equally important role, but not really perhaps the business role that we're talking about, right? And there it's a little bit of stereotyping of are women ready for it? Uh, you know, can you really sort of handle the pressures uh, in a world which is still, still skewed a lot uh, towards, you know, men in top jobs or clients or agency colleagues, et cetera. Now, um, some of the things that, especially for me, right, I'm grateful at Sonali, I'm taking names here, starting with Srini, but, you know, this in WPP, the confidence that they have shown in me and other women like me, and, you know, uh, we have some of them now, just shows that the organization is, you know, it's ready to hand the baton over to women. Now, you're right. If I look around, the numbers are really thin. But the fact that some of us are here, I feel that it'll be inspiring. It's proof of concept that we can do it. I'm very new in this role, but I've been in similar roles, right? I've been in Thailand. I've worked on other businesses. And I feel that, you know, that proving yourself to say that, okay, now she's ready or like her, women are ready. It's taken time, but I feel we are getting there. We, we, sorry, I don't know whether it's 20 or 30 years. I love the fact that you put in the number of years, but I feel that we are in a much better place uh, than before. And that's also because, you know, there's so many different alternative careers that have come out now. So much of confidence in women, so much of the fact that, you know, I want to do something. I want to make my voice heard that somewhere, I think it's that whole infectious optimism that is spreading around to say that, you know, women are ready. Uh, am I happy about it, Sonali? Yes, because I'm happy I got this role. I'm happy there are women. Am I happy overall at the situation? No, because I feel that a lot of women are there waiting in the queue and waiting to shatter that ceiling. Absolutely. Uh, you know, there's an interesting data point that I came across, and I'd like to uh, I'd, I'd like to uh, take this to you, Arundhati, because you know you've been in a leadership role now for a long time, Salesforce now, SBI before, and and I want you to you know either tell me that yes, this data point is correct or not, but the fact is it said that in if if your spouse, uh, which is your husband or your partner, as the case, if you are together with uh, as a unit, if your spouse makes more about forty thousand or more, uh, you know, in a month, uh, then the probability of the wife going out and working is higher than income levels of a man who is below the forty thousand range. This is because of the fact that there there are assumptions that if he is making 40,000 rupees or above, he is likely to be more educated and hence will choose a partner who is also educated. Uh, and of course, the reverse when the income is below 40,000. 
another uh, research data point showed that most of the women who go out and venture and pursue their careers, 70% of that is their mother-in-laws have also done the same in whatever capacity and have been working women. Uh, would you be in agreement with these data points? And secondly, what is your personal story? How did you get the encouragement, the bravado to walk uh, the career path so furiously and of course, uh, you know, get to the epitome of it? Uh, well, uh, you know, in respect of the first data point, I don't quite agree. I okay. don't quite agree because I think, you know, unless the people that were surveyed were urban metro people, okay? Uh, because if you look at the rural areas... Oh, that's reverse. I'm only talking about urban. Absolutely reverse. It's absolutely yes, yes. reverse. Because there are people, in fact, uh, women coming together in the form of SAGs. And again, in my former role, I used to handle a lot of them. Sure. You know, obviously, they were coming from households where the income was very, very low. And it was because the income was low that, you know, the women uh, dared to step out and, you know, uh, make a place for themselves and not only that where they did well they actually got a voice in the way the household was run uh, even in fact uh, you know when we first opened the Jandhan Yojana accounts yeah. uh, we were sort of informally told that it should be in the name of the woman of the household and we tried to do that informally of course that was there was nothing formal in it uh, but we subsequently surveyed two of the talukas where women were mainly the account holders and found that the that the expenditure of those households had gone up most in the area of nutrition and tuition for children and it had gone down maximum for the purchase of intoxicants so you know you can make out the difference for what happens when women coming from a lower economic strata, they actually get money in their hands and they have a say in the way the household is run. Sure. In respect of the other one, that is where the mother and the mother-in-law is working, in a way, I resonate with that. I resonate with that mainly because my mother, she taught herself and got herself certified as a homeopath doctor. And she started her practice when we were in class six. And uh, she would go in the evenings after she had fed us after we returned from school and my father would go and pick her up at 9 30 in the evening so that was the time when she used to devote and frankly she became a pretty well-known homeopath in that city so that you know i was known more as her daughter than you know my um, identity was more linked to us than to my others uh, and one thing that she con continuously told me was that you need an identity for yourself you know, you are not somebody's daughter or sister or a spouse or mother. You are actually somebody in your own right. And therefore, you need to have a career and not a job. Always aim for a career, just not just a job. So to that extent, if you ask me personally, I believe what you are saying may be correct. That is, uh, people who have parents or rather mothers or mothers-in-law who are working, for them, it's a little easier to go out and work because they've had that experience. But having said that, I must also say this, that my mother-in-law, by the way, was just a homemaker. After she realized what I was doing and where I was going, she was one of the most proud persons in the household. So to that extent, I don't really know whether the second uh, you know, data point is quite right or not. Uh, it could be either way. Uh, Naya, do you find all this change that we're trying to talk about or, you know, trying to at least inculcate uh, within our society. How much of this change is palpable? And more importantly, we cannot make this change without the support of men. So how involved are men in actually rallying this change? Just women chattering amongst themselves may not actually be a, a, a productive conversation unless we include people who need to also rally this change. You know what I mean? Well, uh, we've certainly had very, very strong male allies sure. in our journey, right? And that's really why we're here uh, as well. Uh, but, you know, I do want to call out also the role of role models. Um, and I say this all the time, Sonali, that you can't be what you can't see. You know, just the fact that we have Arundhati and Babita and, of course, Sairi. And, you know, these are women who are really 
breaking norms, really breaking stereotypes as well, right? And I think it's important to get their stories out when women are at the leadership level and with the ability to call the shots, they're able to structure and also set the tonality for the kind of culture they want to build internally, which maybe somehow attracts a lot more gender diversity, a lot more uh, women to the fold in general, right? You know, a big part of wh why people drop off in this, like I talked about the hourglass, right? The missing middle, the maternity tax we all pay is because the journey from there to the leadership role is still not well carved out, right? So while I fully agree, I think men have an extremely critical part and they are like, unfortunately, unfortunately, unfortunately the majority and the bulk of the workforce today, and they need to be socialized to why it's important. Also super critical to get the stories out about the women who've made it and their journeys and to let every other young girl who's entering the workforce know that this is normal. You know, it is normal to be a mother and to have ambition. You know, it is normal to be a working woman and to be a leader. Uh, would you say, you know, for instance, uh, Indra Nui says it very well. She says your career clock and your biological clock are in conflict and which has, of course, been established. Having said that, uh, most women on this panel and also a lot of women who actually made it to the top have... Uh, had marriages, have had children and have managed it. And you see more and more uh, women in the workplace in at the, at the middle level coming back from their six month maternity, maternity leave and, you know, getting back onto the workhorse. Uh, so is, is this really an issue still today, at least in urban India? Are we still seeing people, uh, women who, who are actually independent, financially independent, have been making their decisions, are marrying better, are making better choices with their partners. Uh, is that still a big issue that, that you see, Sairi? And also, has the Me Too uh, uh, impact seen any change in the hiring process? I ask you this only because post the Me Too uh, uh, you know, movement, which kind of faded off, uh, unfortunately, in a very, very uh, uh, you know, uh, anticlimactic manner, I would say, uh, we, we, we heard a lot of uh, male managers telling their respective HRs that we would prefer male candidates versus female just out of fear, out of, you know, wanting a lack of complication and all of that. How much has that impact had? Right. So I think, um, at least in my experience, I do think there is a backlash from the Me Too movement on the hiring process. And thankfully so, because I think most organizations that are progressive, that are growing, that are smart, totally understand the need to build diverse, strong workforces, right? So I don't think uh, the Me Too moment is really uh, the challenge here. Uh, and going back to the maternity penalty, I think it does exist. It does exist in different forms. And maybe it's not companies penalizing women directly, but there is a lot of psychological impact of women becoming moms and then just the thereof lack of infrastructure sometimes. And the fact that women are doing a lot of silent work, uh, even when there's no JD around it, especially at homes, the caregiving job is yeah. incessantly uh, women's. I definitely think we need to look at it from a very macro point of view. And I want to make a point here. You know, if we want to move big levers here, then who's in charge of women in workforce in India? You know, if you go to women's ministry, they will say that they're very, their job is to look at reproductive health, ch child safety, women's safety. Women in workforce is not their agenda. If you go to skill ministry, they will tell you women is not a filter they're looking at. And if you go to commerce ministry, obviously they're not looking at it. So I think as a country, we don't have an owner of this KPI. And if you don't have a KPI, you can't allocate resources, you can't track it, and you can't put it on your policy agenda. I think there's a lot of political will. There's a lot of economic potential. A lot of things have changed and moved, but we need to construct it together at the super macro level so that this can be distilled down. We've made some progress in terms of the Maternity Act, in terms of the Parliament Bill, in terms of uh, education, reproductive health, but women in workforce as a KPI needs to be spotlighted more and more allocation needs to be made, both in terms of capital, but as well as resources from the government. Uh, your point of view on that, Ababita, 
on the impact of the Me Too movement, if at all it has had any impact? You know, it's very difficult to gauge whether there has been direct impact because it'll, it'll never be direct. And that's the problem with women and workforce and any other issue, right? It's always overt. Uh, I also agree that there may be, you know, there'll always be that thing of, should we take the risk and employ more women if it leads to, you know, issues like this? which is why we need policymakers and decision makers. And I'm not saying only women can make policies which are pro-women, but I'm saying we need leaders and decision makers who truly are about inclusivity and diversity and who believe that women can contribute to meritocracy as much as men. It's not about really doing a favor by employing women to meet a ratio or a target because that's the wrong way to look at things. Sure. Uh, right? It has to be about, I believe that women can do this. I believe that they are an addition to the strong addition to the workforce, really diverse ideas, etc. Uh, but hard to say, like, you know, because I haven't seen, for example, in our organization, I've not seen a shift because of this in terms of ratio, etc. What I have seen, Sonali, I must say, however, is much more consciousness, much more awareness, much more, um, uh, you, you know, this whole thing of is it a safe workplace, uh, right? Is it a safe workplace to work? And is it a safe workplace to express yourself? I think there's overt uh, conscious policies, programs, initiatives that are working towards that. So that I would say is actually a positive fallout. Sure. Uh, Arundhati, I want to ask you a, a question about sectors that have been uh, you know, pro-women simply with data that sees you see more women working in that sector and of course more women on top and also geography. Would I be right to say that of course the financial space, especially the banking space uh, and its adjacent uh, categories is, is a space where women have traditionally thrived. Uh, and, and if I just look at the, 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 the space that I operated my my, my uh, medium, which is the media sector. I don't think we have a single woman CEO, despite the fact that we're the ones who are commentating, we're the ones enabling discussions, uh, you know, and we're, we're the ones who are supposed to be, uh, you know, change agents. We don't have a single woman CEO heading any organization, news, entertainment, uh, you know, you name it. There is an, it's a very very male dominated leadership as a sector. Similarly, with advertising and, and its adjacent sectors, I think Babita and, and one more lady I can think of were the two women CEOs in an industry which is supposed to be extremely liberal, extremely uh, mature and evolutionary in its thinking. So which sectors would you say are pushing the agenda and which geographies? And geographies here, I want to bring, bring out the bridge between, let's say, the South versus the West versus the East uh, you know, versus the North. And, you know, so which geographies are pushing their women more? So if you ask me from my um, experience, I would say definitely the BFSI industry as well as the IT industry. Sure. Uh, because now I'm in the IT industry and I can see the number of CEOs uh, who are women in the IT industry. Okay. Uh, so I think both of these two industries... Uh, have been very women friendly in the IT industry, by the way, because there are a large number of MNCs, there are very clear diversity goals uh, that are set. And uh, in fact, uh, in an organization like ours, the people who are at my stage or over, they basically uh, have their uh, incentives linked to achieving the diversity goals. Okay. So 10% of your incentives come through only if the diversity goals are met. And by the way, the diversity goals need to be met across the world, not only in the geography in the geography that you are in. So there is a lot of peer pressure around the world to see that the company achieves these diversity goals. And we are not the only MNC where such a thing is there. It is available in other MNCs as well. So to that extent, I would say, you know, both these sectors have been women friendly. Uh, in respect of geographies, you know, again, I think uh, the South and the East probably lead in that way sure. rather than the North and the West. And one of the reasons probably has been uh, the safety of uh, women in these areas. And uh, 
that is one of the reason why people have been able to sort of step out of the households and to work, even though even in, in places there might be pockets of conservatism, but uh, unlike in probably the North and the West, <clears throat> where we have seen far more uh, the protectionism of women, so to speak. Uh, these two uh, geographies probably are a little better off uh, where uh, in, in allowing their women folk to step out of the household to work and to actually, you know, take up uh, whatever they want to do uh, in a way that is far more supportive, probably. Uh, so, yeah, I mean, as per my uh, uh, experience, that's what it says. Uh, but I'm sure there are other industries as well where women are doing well. Uh, but you are right about the media, the entertainment industries, the other industry that probably needs a lot more is the manufacturing sector. You still don't see that many women on the factory floors. Uh, it doesn't happen. Yes, there are exceptions, uh, but they are exceptions. They are not the rule. Absolutely. Uh you know, uh, Naya, you 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 you're you're a uh, uh, you know quite a, uh, a mover shaker because of you know what you've achieved uh, despite your gender. Let me put it like that. Uh, what what would you say have been the your uh, predicaments while trying to uh, you know make uh, your ecosystem take you more seriously? For instance. Uh, I know one data point that was put out, uh, and this was uh, women who, have, who are reasonably successful giving mentorship and advice to younger women saying, you know, it is important for men to look at you uh, and, and take you seriously, which means the way you dress at your workplace and the way you position yourself is very important. So if you wear a sari at work, right? Their, their entire demeanor towards you will change. And the amount of seriousness given to, uh, to you and what you're saying in your stature uh, changes because then a sari equals uh, mother-like status. And this is a very India kind of uh, you know, example and definitely not something that we can use in the West. But this is something that was, was said that you know, power dressing is so important, positioning is so important, and hence wearing that sari is so important. What do you think? <laughs> you know, so I, uh, my mother has worn a sari all her life and she's been a very successful working woman herself, is on multiple boards herself right now. And that's what she feels is the most authentic version of presenting herself. For me, I, I don't know how to drape a sari scenario. <laughs> so, you know, and having been, uh, you know, a, a female founder in tech and now in consumer, right, I've kind of had to obviously be in situations where, you know, when you're like, literally you're talking to Mark Zuckerberg, right? Yeah. And you're therefore wearing something that looks like appropriately techie in some sense. But I think, uh, and then consumer, right? I mean, I'm now representing in the, in the face in some ways of a beauty and personal care conglomerate, right? So I have to look presentable at all times in some sense, again there. But, you know, I think what I've really come back to realizing is that uh, two things, right? One is that people today uh, respect the most authentic version of you. Right. And, you know, as individual, almost brands ourselves in some sense, right. And person like in personas ourselves, what we wear, how we talk, how we uh, remain consistent in every interaction actually gives people comfort in the fact that you're actually authentic and you're being true to yourself. Right. And honestly, it also gives me comfort because I'm not changing myself for anybody out there. Right. So I stay authentic to who I am. You know, if I'm feeling a certain way, I dress a certain way. And that's who I've become and who that's who I am. I think the second piece to it is that, you know, when you're in situations which demand a certain level of formality. Right. Then I think it's also important to respect the gravitas of the situation because it's also respectful to the people in that situation. So I think accordingly, I think, you know, you can dress if you feel like in that in that perspective but I want to just kind of step back and, and ask us all this right I mean these questions of dressing right and these questions of putting on this face and this bravado it's only addressed to women I don't think men are ever asked these questions right men can rock up in whatever they choose to wear so I, I'm really hopeful that over time we'll all get to that point where we are able to be the most authentic versions of ourselves and you know we're looked at beyond just how we dress and how we present ourselves and also maybe how we talk because we talk different you know we talk the way we talk um 
So I'm hoping, I'm, I'm really hopeful for that future. And if all of us set it, right, then it becomes the norm. If only one of us sets it, it doesn't become the norm. Sure. I'm all for like being your authentic self. But while we reach there in that journey, let me ask the two women in sarees who are, uh, you know, power dressers. Uh, is that power dressing in a male, in a man's world, in a, in, in a, you know, in a male society? Uh, Arundhati, ma'am, would you like to go first? And then I can... No, Babita, you go first and then I'll tell you. <laughs> all right. You so, okay. uh, so, Nali, I was almost about to text you. Please throw me this question. Okay, so thank oh, you. Oh, really? Wow. <laughs> <laughs> I'll tell you. I love saris. Uh, I must say I'm wearing a mekla today, which is uh, from Assam, where I come from, which is a version of the sari. And uh, I feel I'm just building on to what Naya said, right? Uh, first of all, it's about our authentic self. But I feel more importantly, a lot of women, me included, by the way, uh, like in Thailand for the two and a half years I was there, I just didn't wear a sari, right? And that's my big regret. In fact, I'm three days here into the role and I wish I'd done more of this. Uh, I just feel sometimes we've also brought it upon ourselves as women, because especially when we are competing in a man's world and especially in our own journeys, right? When there were so many men around us, there was this compulsive need at that point in time, not today, to really look the part. Because when you walk into a meeting, you feel you look the part. A lot of women at least thought that way. When you dress up, maybe in a blazer or a trouser or a shirt or something like that. And then of course you have the fashion industry and the styling industry, then that whets that appetite, right? Because that becomes a trend. So anybody who's powerful, who's working, you know, you become that. I feel as women leaders, this is a great, and influencers, not just leaders. This is a great way of really showing a young generation that you can be comfortable in absolutely anything you wear. And there's no badge or label on, okay, I'm wearing a sari today, so I'm traditional. I'm wearing a Western wear today, so I feel more this. And this, and therefore, I said, I thought about what I would wear today. And I just felt so good wearing a sari. So uh, that's pretty much it. I really feel it. It's uh, we should be very comfortable in whatever we choose to wear. And we look... The power comes, Sonali, from what we say and what we do, and definitely not in what we wear. Arundhati? Yeah, so um, I remember, you know, when I joined for my first orientation program in 1977, at that point of time, I was to wear uh, jeans and a top. And uh, the gentleman who was uh, handling us uh, the orientation program, he was a senior officer, so he just took me aside and he said, and by the way, at that time, you know, my weight was all of 39 kgs. Not uh, believable right now, seeing me, it was. All right. I was just 21 and a half. And uh, he told me that, you know, you will be going into a branch and you will be the branch manager. Uh, but uh, you will actually have to handle people who will be your father's age. Uh, so it's, you know, it's very difficult to give you that kind of uh, respect that you want to command unless you dress the part. OK. And uh, again, he was very apologetic about it. And he told me, I'm just telling you this because I feel it will make your life a little easier. And actually speaking, I'll tell you till the age of 40, I continued to wear saris with high neck blouses uh, so that, you know, by no means, because I was always on the floor walking around this, that, and the other, that there would be no wardrobe mishaps. And therefore, you know, I used to wear high neck blouses and I used to wear saris, very well pinned so that, you know, by the end of the day, I would appear just as, uh, you know, I would appear in the beginning of the day. Okay, so that became my style, more or less. And I became comfortable in it. Having said that, you know, subsequently now, after 40 years in the bank where I wore only saris, now that I have gone into another institution where everybody, where the average age is 26, 27, and probably it's gone up by a year by me joining, but otherwise the average age is around that. So these, these uh, young adults, they are all in different kinds of dress and they would like to see me in those kinds of dresses as well. So I've taken to, you know, <laughs> now alternating between all kinds of dresses. So whether it be Western dresses, whether it be the sari, I do everything. And I find, you know, it doesn't really matter what you are in. As long as you feel comfortable in it yourself, you feel confident about the way you carry yourself. And frankly speaking, it's the confidence that makes you look good. It isn't the dress that you have put on.
So that being the case, I think, you know, this question about dresses is something that we should definitely put on the side. It's not relevant. It really is not. You can really wear anything you want as long as you feel good about it, as long as you feel confident in it. So, you know, all of this is, I think, a little bit of a, uh, a diversion rather from the main topic. But having said that, it's still important for us to talk about it. Uh, but it's also important for us to be ourselves. That's the main thing. Well, thank you for sharing such an intimate story. Uh, it really warmed the cockles of my heart. So thank you for that. But, you know, let me uh, end this special showing with you, Sairi, in terms of, you know, where we are and how much do we need uh, to do to, uh, to, you know, achieve what we want to achieve. I think, uh, you know, we need to put our money where our mouth is. As a country, we definitely need more capital in hands of women and not just venture capital, but also debt, loans, grants. I do feel that capital is a big driver of change and uh, uh, it, it, it speeds time uh, faster than anything else. Uh, we do need policy level interventions. I do think that as, as a country, we need to... Uh, measure uh, women in workforce a lot more, a lot more uh, diligently. You know, today, I think it's, uh, uh, it's still all over the place. Our data is uh, very varied, but also the fact that we may have our own model of economic participation of women. And, uh, you know, and entrepreneurship potentially is that engine that will perhaps uh, be the solution to our problems right now because uh, while we technology is disrupting jobs all over the world, but India is probably the only country where entrepreneurship sits at the center of our uh, our development. And I think uh, women in entrepreneurship is a very core theme we should examine because that also is a potentially employment generating theme. And of course, I, I do believe these conversations are important. We possibly couldn't imagine 10 years ago, 15 years ago, are here now. Things like remote work, things like num equal number of women in IITs and IIMs and STEM pipelines, uh, the number of women uh, get getting into the venture industry. And of course, uh, I know it's still two and a half to 3% of venture dollars that go to women, but uh, the rails are set. I think we need to add a lot more fuel power to it, uh, sometimes in form of capital, sometimes in form of policy. And of course, in making sure all our role models are inspiring the respective communities. So there are a lot of women who are bringing change. And I think it's important to sort of make sure this conversation doesn't get drowned. Absolutely. But on that note, uh, thank you all four of you for being champions uh, of the female gender. I'm sure more and more uh, women across all levels will see and hear you and be inspired to stay the course, uh, you know, to achieve whatever it is that they desire. And thank you so much. And hopefully I'll call you back to have this conversation very quickly as a follow up and not wait for the 8th of March, 2025. Thank you so much.